want to stand over there? I will stand over here until you intrude me, and then I'll take a step back. All right, we'll get started here in uh, about 30 seconds. All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jens Kohnsen. Um, we'll be talking today about uh, performance-based solutions for lithium-ion battery hazards in the manufacturing environment. Um, I should say, like, um, this presentation is geared towards fire hazards in particular, so we will be focusing primarily on that. Um, I'm here today, uh, well, my, I mentioned my name is Jens Kohns, I'm Vice President uh, with Jensen Hughes for the Midwest Reason, region. I'm here today with my uh, colleague uh, Mark Susky, who's uh, going to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mark Susky, Jensen Hughes, uh, Technical Fellow. All right, then we'll roll. Um, here's the agenda that we have uh, prepared uh, for today. So first, you know, well, let's go over the objective of this presentation. You know, why, why are we here? What are we talking about? What point do, do we about our company so that you have an idea uh, from what angle, from what perspective we, we see uh, this issue. We'll review lithium-ion battery hazards. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the uh, selected uh, fire code and fire life safety code requirements and um, how we can uh, meet them or exceed them or sometimes we will find there are no defined requirements so how can we protect appropriately so we'll do that um, by uh, applying risk evaluation techniques so we'll go over a few of those and then focus on the uh, bow tie um, modeling technique um, every risk model needs a good input that input comes from performance-based solutions such as testing or engineering analysis methods. Um, Mark will take that part uh, of the presentation over and then end it with the uh, key takeaway so that everybody has something uh, to take home from this. So um, we actually were here last year and we gave a presentation on hazards associated with lithium-ion batteries. So we will only touch five minutes on that, do like a brief recap so that everybody knows what we are trying to prevent or to mitigate. And then we will focus on solutions, how we can mitigate the risks associated with lithium ion battery hazards and how to meet regulatory requirements. You know, there are like uh, many new facilities for EV manufacturing and battery manufacturing being built right now. The authorities need to provide permission. They need to be happy. We all need to have a good feeling about that, uh, uh, that uh, all hazards can be adequately mitigated. So that's what we're going to try to tell you guys today. So what is Jensen Hughes? Um, Jensen Hughes is an engineering consulting firm. Um, we are pretty much in uh, safety, security, and risk mitigation. So we are a global company, 1,500 employees. We work with many of the stakeholders out there, engineers, architects, insurance firms, end users, you know, you name it. So if you don't know us, uh, feel free to look us up and uh, get an idea about what we do. Um, in the automotive, in particular EV and battery manufacturing space, and also energy storage, you know, we will also, we will talk about that a little bit because there's a crossover. Um, we primarily provide uh, code and standard consulting, emergency response and action plans, um, fire life safety uh, design, uh, smoke explosion control, risk analyses and performance-based methods, what we will be focusing on today. Um, I should also say um, I handed out like a few place cards earlier that have a teeny tiny QR code on it. If your phone manages to actually capture that, you know, you can send me a message and I will send you guys a copy of the 
presentation if you're interested in it. Likewise, there will be a recording available later. If your camera is not good enough, I understand mine wasn't. Um, there will be a QR code on the last slide that people can scan or just like hit me later and I give you my business card and we can be in touch, okay? Because I notice some people are taking photos of the slides, which is fine, please do so. But if you want the recording, we are happy to share that. All right, so now let's dive into the review of lithium ion battery hazards. Before we do that, let's just like briefly review what a lithium ion battery cell is, right? The battery cell is a basic functional electrochemical unit. You know, a battery can be different things, but in lithium ion space, we talk about electrochemical. So when we take a p look at the picture on the right, you know, we have like an anode on the left, the cathode on the right, separator in the middle. We've got a flammable electrolyte in the middle floating around, and uh, ions are hopping from left and right, depending if they're like being charged or discharged. Um, Cell can have different form factors. You know, most popular ones are like a pouch cell. It's for example, SK or LG, or cylindrical cells like Tesla or Panasonic. Or we have prismatic cells, which is like often Samsung or CATL in the automotive space, right? Um, there are different chemistries. Um, most popular, I would say, in automotive are like the uh, nickel manganese cobalt. You know, that's an LG thing or like NCA, likewise LFP, lithium iron phosphate. Um, what's important to note, since this is also a fire safety talk, is that these chemistries that there's no in these cells, there's no lithium metal, so it's not water reactive. So if we're dealing with battery fires, it's okay to put water on it, right? Otherwise, we're always thinking like, oh, lithium, no, don't put water on it, you know, but it's not the case. That was the case for a lithium battery, a primary battery, but not for a secondary lithium ion battery, right? Um, so when we take a look at the separator, what we then worry about if that separator degrades for some reason or breaks down, right? Because now we have like a mixing of the stuff on the left and the stuff on the right. We have a short circuit in the cell. We have like some unintended chemistry going on and that leads to a reaction. That re reaction gets more intense with the state of charge of the battery. Um, but in most cases, it'll lead then to a so-called thermal runaway uh, condition. So a thermal runaway is an exothermic uh, chemical reaction. If we you know, um, remember that from our like, high school and university days, unless you're a chemist and you deal with it every day, right? it's a very accelerating um, reaction in which uh, the typical consequence is that the cell will, will rupture, burst open, and, uh, and release uh, fairly large amounts of, of flammable gas, okay? Um, in some cases, depending on the chemistry and again on the state of charge, that release of gas might catch fire. So, um, so we, we can have um, burning reactions or like venting reactions with the thermal runaway. Um, what causes it is a short circuit, as I mentioned earlier. But uh, what, causes the what causes the short circuit? And that's typically, we distinguish four main things. One is, it's just like a manufacturing defect. You know? So there is, when we make a lot of batteries in manufacturing, um, every now and then we're gonna have a bad apple. You know, it could be every mi one million or 10 million cell, there could be a, a bad, uh, bad battery cell involved. Second one is an overcharge condition. You know, when we make a battery later, we're going to have like charge discharging operations to test the cell. That is where stuff can happen, in particular when we overcharge or when we overheat. And the last one is a mechanical uh, abuse situation um, where like, you know, the cell was dropped or something like that, you know. Um, how a thermal runaway looks, you can see that on the picture in the middle, you know, that vent gas caught, caught fire, so we have like torch-like flames. We also have like, we see this jet of liquid electrolyte coming out. It's looking like a white smoke here because it is, uh, it is um, you know, reacting with the humidity in the surrounding air. So now we have the hazard identified. Let's quantify it a little bit further to underline 
the scale or the magnitude of what the problem could be. Okay? So as I mentioned, the, the gas that comes out of the cell is flammable. So what is it comprised of? You know, it is basically a dirty cocktail. It's a dirty mix of stuff. Um, we call it battery gas for the lack of better terms. Um, and it's primarily carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, hydrogen, and uh, hydrocarbons. Depending on the chemistry, you can see in the pie chart, this varies. Sometimes you might have 20% hydrogen, sometimes you might have 35, and so on. But roughly a third is typically hydrogen. It varies with, um, based on, on different factors. Okay? Um, in addition to uh, flammability components, we also may have toxic components like uh, uh, hydrofluoric gas or HCN. You know, so we are worried about worker safety, first responder safety when there's a battery fire. Right? Um, and here's like a fun exercise, uh, just like to give us uh, some understanding of like, okay, how much gas, what are we worried about, right? So I put like this table in here, which is like a, from an EPRI paper um, that was referencing a dissertation from a re recent uh, PhD student. He performed 21 different tests and captured that data. Um, a rise in Sweden actually came out with a new paper just last month with a much larger series of tests pretty much confirming this table. Um, but basically it means um, there's a mean value of 0 0.4 liters per watt hour. So, you know, what does that mean when we are having like an automotive pack, right? We have like, at, at, at this point, a 10 kilowatt hour is like a small battery in an EV, right? We are going now like to 100 kilowatt hours, right? So if that table is true, 10 kilowatt hours, if that would be fully consumed in a thermal runaway event, would be 4,000 liters of flammable gas, you know? So at a lower flammability limit of 10%, you know, you can do the math what that means, that you could actually have an explosible concentration uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a room, you know? So it's important that we protect uh, against uh, explosions in that scenario. So this is also important, of course, in storage arrangements, because once we are done with manufacturing the cells, they have been charged and discharged, they're going to go in large warehouses. And, um, you know, if we have a fire in a warehouse, that can be pretty devastating because the fire can, can uh, propagate from cubby to cubby in the storage arrangement. So the severity of that reaction then varies, you know, based on the, what's the energy density of the cell? How big is the cell? We are going now to really big cells, right? Pushing, let's say, 100 amp hour in one cell, right? Um, also, what's the construction material and what's the state of charge, right? Like a higher state of charge generally makes the whole thing more volatile. So now when we are thinking about storing these cells, we want to make sure that everything is safe, right? And normally, we look at uh, fire safety codes and building codes that tell us what to do. And um, unfortunately, the codes and standard world has not really caught up yet in addressing that hazard. You know? For example, NFPA 13, which is like the code for, for designing a sprinkler system, tells you do not use that code when you're st storing lithium ion batteries. It does not apply. right? So where do you get the technical basis from? Or where does the authority having jurisdiction, what do they want? What, what do they deem as safe, right? So there's a little bit of a gray area. And um, what people have started doing is, because the, the energy storage industry seems to be a little ahead with that. You know, we have a standard like NFPA 855, which is like the installation guide for energy storage systems, where we have like where we can have several hundreds of megawatts hours of stored batteries in an indoor arrangement. So we can take a look at that. Likewise, UL9540, which is the listing standard for energy storage systems, or 9540A, which is like the thermal runaway testing standard for lithium ion cells, you know. These standards don't really directly apply to an automotive manufacturing environment. But AHJs have started to look at those and take the best lessons learned from them uh, and apply them to the manufacturing environment. You know, that's why we are pointing them out here and having 
listed them for you guys. There are like more codes and standards here um, that can be referenced and the best can be taken from them. But more work needs to be done. Um, on the building side then, you know, we have now finally a chapter in the International Fire Code that does provide some language. It's a lot of language um, that is very similar from NFPA 855. Um, it's a start, but it's not complete. You know? Earlier this year, FM Global actually updated their commodity classification data sheet, which is a really good step. Um, there we can get guidance on how to properly, safely store lithium ion batteries. Um, but again, more needs to be done. So that leaves the question, um, or before I get there, it's like, um, yeah, that leaves the question, like, how do we, how do we properly, how do we properly protect, you know? And generally what we want to do is like, we want to monitor and prevent. If sensors monitor the condition and there is an alarm, we want to make sure that we alert and react, you know, we evacuate, get people out, get first responders in, suppress the fire and so on, and make sure, you know, we have a good, uh, good emergency response uh, and uh, in place and defined manual actions. But this general safety approach, if like codes and standards are not telling us how to do it properly, you know, we need to build our own technical basis. And, you know, we are proposing here today to you guys, you know, we can do that with a risk evaluation and performance-based solutions. Um, we found that is important because we actually did have a number of fire incidences now in large uh, facilities that handle lithium-ion batteries, you know, that happens. Um, the question is really not like, you know, if I have a fire, the question is like, when will I have an incident I need to deal with? And it just has to do with the huge amount of batteries that are being moved through these facilities, right? It's just like a probability game in a way, you know? We have now facilities that store upwards of 10 million cells, you know? They're for sure, there are going to be a handful of bad cells in, the, in that storage arrangement, you know? So we need to plan on the cell failure. And we need to have something that we can demonstrate, uh, you know, to like uh, the company, the workers, and the authorities, um, you know, that the approach is safe. So when we look at what risk evaluation methods are out there, you know, there are several common ones that we can think of, right? So I'm highlighting here only four that we see in the automotive space or also in other spaces, but I will really focus only on one because I think it's a nice, simple tool to communicate with all stakeholders, you know? So I think we've all seen like failure mode and effects analyses. You know, that's a very helpful tool. I find it's a, it's a good tool to look at the product and make the product better or a system. Um, we have hazard and operability uh, studies like HAZOPS, you know, that flow into a process hazard analysis. It's very popular in the chemical industry we can use that in the environment uh, of manufacturing um, as well, but um, I think it might be a little bit too complex for authorities to process if they are not specialized, you know. The, the tricky thing is some of the new battery manufacturing facilities now under construction are going in very rural areas where you do not have um, authorities that have like five full-time professional engineers on staff, you know, to dive into this stuff, you know. So that's where, you know, we kind of need to build a, build a bridge and try to um, communicate in a, in, a, in a simple way, you know, what is really moving the needle, you know. Likewise, fault tree analysis is a great tool. Personally, I know it quite a bit from the nuclear industry. Um, it has also the um, advantage that we can feed quantitative data into it. And then we have a quantitative risk analysis, so we can actually precisely calculate levels of risks. But again, this might not necessarily be helpful when you talk to stakeholders, you know, that are not uh, highly technically minded. So that leaves us with a bow tie analysis I wanted to highlight, um, which actually has been used in oil and gas quite a bit, and we see it, uh, we see it being used in battery manufacturing, <laughs> that wasn't me, <laughs> in battery manufacturing more often. 
Um, and that's a very simple visual tool. We can start very simple and build this out and become more complex. And that's a very wonderful tool to make all the stakeholders understand. And we can enhance safety. We can optimize designs. We can reduce cost and obtain that regulatory compliance, which is a hurdle, you know. So in a minute here, we're going to jump into an example. But how does it work? You know, it actually looks like a bow tie, how we're going to feel out. But it, it, we will draw out possible causes and consequences for a hazard. And we will visualize the barriers and controls in place to prevent it. Um, we can use it to model battery fires and to identify then the potential causes of battery fires and design better, better prevention. So we can walk through this example here, and that I think still looks like a bow tie. I tried my best in drawing this with the crude tools that are available in, in PowerPoint, right? But if we, if we use the example of our charge discharge area, you know, we have like, you know, the battery pack now comes in, let's say it's a 10 kilowatt hour pack, I used that previously as an example, it's lying on the test table, you want to charge and discharge it, make sure it's good, right? what we are mostly worried about is that thing going into thermal runaway or catching fire. So we put the threats on the left and we put the consequences on the right. And then between the threats and the hazard are our preventative barriers in form of those diagonal lines. And on the other side, we have our recovery barriers, right? So when we're thinking about what could be threats, we discussed, well, the ba battery could overheat. That would be bad, right? Because like the separator has a very low melting temperature. We don't want that. Um, we could have an electrical fault, right? Could also like harm the separator, or we could have a short circuit. So what preventative barriers could we put in place? And I only put one down for each threat. You know, like you really start thinking about this hard, and you want to have engineers involved, technicians involved, knowledgeable people, operators, right, get some different perspectives um, because one person doesn't know everything. So then we can install temperature alarms, we can have voltage regulation installed, and we can have overcurrent protection. Now if that fails, you know, what could happen? We could have the battery fire or a thermal runaway. We could have an arc flash, somebody could get injured, you know, and what can we do now to recover from that? You know, we can install fire protection, uh, fire suppression system. We can have reactive power compensation and a well thought out um, emergency response, you know? So that's a very simple example, but I think, I hope you get the sense when you sit down with a reviewer from the authorities and you walk through something like this that like everybody can understand that, right? And once you're all on the same page, um, you start building this out further, you know? So it can, get, it can grow from there and become more complicated. And I realize you can't really read what that means. Um, but I just wanted to, to highlight, this was taken from an EPRI report. They only looked at the external and environmental risks for batteries, uh, lithium-ion batteries in storage. And that's their board diagram that they came up with. But in the center, it starts very simple, like simple um, as our example looked, right? And then you make it more complex. So um, obviously, you need a software at that point. You know, you're not doing that with, uh, with pen and paper anymore. So what's interesting, when you, when you see this full bow tie map, right, you see that actually that some, uh, some consequences are actually initiating events for the, for the next hazard, so to speak. So it all interacts with each other, it feeds back, right? But when we recap on it, so what we are trying to do with the bow tie model is we try to, to capture the hazards that we have in the manufacturing environment with lithium ion batteries in a single model. That we can use that to communicate with stakeholders and make sure that our protect, protection concept, our safety concept, um, is appropriate. You know, if we use it in the design stage, even 
Very often we use it when stuff is already done, you know, after the fact. It's actually good to use it before that as a, as a helpful design tool so that you can make changes still and implement recommendation. And then lastly, again, you know, it is, it is also, it can be used as a, to demonstrate that you meet an equivalent level of protection, you know, because there, there are some requirements in fire codes, but they may not be applicable or not feasible to, to accomplish on the scale that we are talking about today in battery manufacturing. Then you can ask an authority for like a variance, for code variance request, so to speak, that's how it's called, and demonstrate with this model that while not meet the requirement by the letter, you meet the intent of it. You know? um, but then like every good model or software solution is like garbage in, garbage out, right? We do need good data. We need to have good informed decision making. So the data that we feed in this model can come from performance-based solutions. And this is where I over uh, to my colleague, Mark. All right, thank you, Jens. As he discussed, we're gonna start talking about some of our performance-based design solutions that we may use to help mitigate these problems and these issues or the hazards that are involved. Now, one of the reasons why we would use one, a performance-based design solution, as Jens touched on earlier, is the code in a lot of aspects hasn't caught up to where the technology is going. In certain areas of the facilities in these Plants are extremely large, and they're, you know, handling chemicals and, and other, you know, hazardous materials, and the code isn't quite there yet. Um, so what we're trying to do with our performance-based solutions is we're coming up with alternative methods to meet the intent of what the code is going to require: the life safety that's necessary inside of the code, the protections for, um, you know, the, the occupants as well as you know the you know surrounding communities and those kind of things. So. So first of all, up on the screen, you'll see a definition of what a performance-based design is. This is taken directly from SFPE Handbook, the Society of Fire Protection Engineers. And if you want to make something more difficult than it truly is, ask an engineer to define it, and that's what you get. So basically, a performance-based design is first you have to identify your hazard. Then I have to come up with a several life safety um, objectives. What are my objectives? How am I going to protect it? And then I need to determine the probability of is this going to happen, and then I have to find some tools to help test the hypothesis of what I've just defined as my safety, my goals, and my objectives. So in a nutshell, that's basically what the performance-based design, um, that's basically what the performance-based design, you know, wraps around. So when we look at the performance-based design approach, there are several, you know, really significant advantages and there are several disadvantages and we would be remiss if we didn't, you know, also as much as we're proponents of this performance-based design approach, we'd be a little bit remiss if we didn't also tell you some of the disadvantages that are there. So you're, you know, you as the end users are aware to make your decisions. So one of the very, you know, the, on the top of the list positives is it provides like fire point fire protection for a specific hazard. You know, like Jen said earlier, performance-based design is completed for a lot of different aspects. Our presentation today is strictly fire protection, life safety. So those, the solutions that we use are specifically point identified to that hazard. So they're very specific. Also, as we talked about several times, it works well when the code either A, hasn't been fully defined in that hazard area yet, so we have to come up with an alternative means, or B, that I don't think I put on here, is that sometimes codes may be too onerous and maybe too restrictive. So we also use the performance-based design criteria and this approach to help our clients achieve that same level of life safety that the code intends without, you know, maybe going back to that final bullet point, saves our clients money. Because now we've, we've came up with a solution that meets the code intent that financially is more cost effective. We don't like to say cheaper, we always say cost effective engineering. So we've, we've determined a, a, a more cost effective solution to their problem. 
So several of the, the disadvantages in, in the number one, the lack of flexibility is kind of key. Once that performance-based design solution is locked in, that hazard, you're locked into that solution. So if, for example, whatever hazard I'm protecting, if that hazard gets changed, manipulated, or modified in any particular way, you would have to go back to redo that performance-based design to ensure that the criteria that you used during that first phase is still accurate. Uh, the next one is a lot of times it requires specialized tools and professionals and engineering firms to you know, help with creating the models and creating the, the well, assembling the data that, that Jens had spoke about earlier. So you take all that data, you put it together, you put it in a computer program or you're, you're doing computations. Um, so usually it requires an expert. And the last one is a lot of times it can take longer than the prescriptive code requirements. A typical code requirement, if I'm submitting a set of sprinkler drawings to an AHJ, it's all written right in front of him. He goes through NFPA 13, says bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, you're good, stamp, it's out the door. These solutions, a lot of times, they take a lot longer. There's more experts involved. Um, it'll have several layers of a review process. So it is a lot more time consuming. So sometimes if time is of the essence, you know, these processes should start early on if you know that you're gonna have one of these scenarios that may require some sort of performance-based design scenario, you may wanna start that process early. So, several on the screen are several of the tools that we use currently in EV manufacturing right now. So, one of them is dust hazard analysis. In certain areas within the manufacturing process, we're creating combustible dust. Now the process equipment, a lot of times, when we install the process equipment, we, the space needed, it takes up, a lot, it takes up a lot of room. And we can't meet the combustible dust prescriptive code when it comes to the equipment. So by performing a dust hazard analysis, we can then turn around, go to the HJ and say, yeah, we're not meeting the prescriptive code for the installation of our equipment, our dust collectors, and those types of uh, pieces of equipment. But we do have this DHA saying we are mitigating all of the hazards. Uh, Jens touched on it, so I'm just, Jens talked about the risk hazard analysis, so I'm just gonna kind of touch on that a little further. That is probably one of the key items that we think is necessary when you're working in these, at, in the, in these environments. That risk hazard analysis is there, and that's really what's gonna set your game plan for the rest of that design. It's going to set the design criteria. It's going to set the design criteria for the sprinkler system. It's going to set the design criteria for any sort of smoke, smoke detection systems, any sort of gas detection systems, any sort of um, you know venting that you may need, ventilation, you know those kind of uh, those kind of things, and it'll help set that. So once that's in place, you're locked in. You have your protection strategy specifically for your protected hazard. And some of the items that Jens didn't talk about, but some of the items that we look at during this process is you know, the cell chemistry, the combustion energy. We also look at the test data, compare that to what, you know, um, the, the test data, and we compare that to the storage configuration. How are these cells being stored? Are we storing them right next to each other? Are we separating them? You know, those kind of things. And then the manufacturing process as a whole. And it's you know, usually done at a fairly high level. So, and you know, in the EV manufacturing area, you know, some of the areas that we're most interested in, you know, currently are the formation where they're charging the aging and the testing areas. Because now, you know, all of a sudden, they've determined that the 30% state of charge is no longer sufficient to determine if there's actually defects within the cell. So they're starting to charge the, the cells to higher. They're starting to charge the battery, the cells up to like a 62% charge, state of charge now, which then is a little bit more, you know, for years, the industry said under 30, we're good, you know, no problem, it's kind of an inert battery, you know, not a big deal, but now we're charging that battery up to 62%. So there is, you know, research and studies being done on how that affects, how that's going to affect, you know, the overall fire and protection and life safety. And then the last one on the list is computational fluid dynamics modeling. And we do a lot of this for the battery, particularly for um, EV manufacturing. This is actually an ESS type storage configuration. So it's 
not necessarily an EV plant, but it's a ESS. And what, what the two examples show you using the CFD modeling is it's showing gas dispersion throughout a, uh, a compartment or a space or a building, simulating battery, the cells venting. One is with the AC, HVAC off and the other one is with the HVAC on. And as you can see, there's a significant difference between those two. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to target and pinpoint our detection strategy for gas a lot better. Instead of just thinking where we want to put these detectors and oh, I'll put them here, here, and here, or I'll just space them as the code tells me to space them. Well, this way we actually have better data knowing, okay, if I have my HVAC off, here's where my gas is going to be or if I have my HVAC on. So it allows us a lot smarter and a lot more pinpoint, which could be, you know, in a large space, it, it could be a significant difference on how many, where I'm placing these detectors. The next one is a program we call Fire Dynamic Simulator, or FDS, and this one basically what it does is it is a fire and smoke model where we're building fake, well, I don't, don't mean they're fake, but we're building computer generated fires inside of a computer program that simulates you know, batteries, on, you know, bat uh, batteries in the process of combustion. And it allows us then to look at how that, how that fire is gonna develop in that space, and it also shows us how the smoke is gonna migrate throughout that entire facility. So we also, in conjunction with this, we use another program called DTEC, which will predict what temperature my sprinkler system is gonna go off. So then we'll have a better understanding of A, how big that fire is gonna get, how quickly that fire is gonna evolve, and then B, what temperature my sprinkler system is gonna go off at. So we often use that one in conjunction with an occupant egress analysis because one of the most significant issues that we have inside of these large manufacturing areas is we, we are past our 400 feet travel distance for an F1 or even in some of the high hazard areas, we're, we're extending past that. So what we need to show the AHJ is we can still evacuate people out of that building safely while still exceeding the, the travel distances that are set inside of the prescriptive code. And by overlaying the smoke model, which gives us our available, our available um, ten, uh, tenable environment time, in conjunction with our egress analysis that shows how long it's gonna take people to get out of the building time, we can show them by the time our fire smoke layer gets down to six feet, our people are all out of the building and they're safe and everybody's happy. And so we've, we've done that in numerous places to help out our clients, um, help get variances and get past that 400 feet travel distance. All right, that's it. So the key takeaways. So Jens went through some of the standards and regulations, which are nice to know and they're nice there. And UL is still doing a lot of testing and FM and everybody's still doing testing on this. And the codes are still evolving to this day. So, you know, stay tuned next year if we're here again, codes may change and we may be talking about changes to the code. Uh, but just know that they are there and we still have to comply where the codes are compliant. We still need to comply with those codes. The risk evaluation portion, you know, that, that is a critical item to this whole entire process because it does, like I said, it sets the game plan for those areas that we don't have prescriptive requirements. It really does. It gives you, you know, your sprinklers, your smoke, your, your gas detections, you know, all of those, all of those, you know, fire protection and life safety systems there that are not only to protect the people, but also the building structure and, and everybody involved. And then last was a performance-based design. You know, obviously we're a big proponent of it. We use it on a regular basis. We have the tools and, you know, the, the tools necessary to complete them. Um, so with that, any questions? He had his hand up first, yeah. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I'm just curious uh, about the simulations. What was the size of the facility, like the uh, dimensions of of the building, and uh, what uh, uh, mm, capacity of the battery was used in this simulation? So this was a very large energy storage system uh, facility. Uh, 
still smaller than a battery manufacturing plant. Uh, um, this was on the order of several hundred thousand square feet, but well under one million square feet. Um, there were actually two different type of batteries in that facility. There was like one side was LFP, the other side was NMC. And I believe, I'm just speaking from memory, uh, the LFP cell was about 140 amp hour prism prismatic form factor. Or lots of them, you know. <laughs> yeah. Where did the microphone go? <laughs> One more question. Oh, then over there. Hi, great, pre great presentation, by the way. Um, had a question on the recommended dust hazard analysis for anode uh, mixing. What about cathode mixing? Is powderous lithium dangerous, not dangerous, and combustible? Not in battery form, but in the manufacturing floor. Yeah, I just I I put the anode side up there on the slide, and just so everybody knows that we were we we're trying to be extremely generic with our presentation. Um, we've worked with many different manufacturers, so we're not trying to call or you know say anything one about the other. Normally, the ones that we've had, we've had more issues on the anode side than the cathode side, so that's the reason I just had the anode side up there. But with that said. It is recommended still to get both, all of the dust tested, uh, just to make sure that you know if it's non-combusted, if it's you know non-explosible, then you're fine, you're good. Keep your house cleaning in order, and you're good. If it's explosible, then obviously you go through the DHA process, and you know help the process to mitigate it. But that was it. That was the reason it was up there. Is is powdered lithium a concern for combustibility in the manufacturing process? Yeah, I, I, I would need to look at that one. I actually cannot tell you from the top of my head. Um, I more deal with the uh, with the chemical aspects uh, of the you know thermal runaway, um, but it's a good question. So let me let me look that up for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, as you got to hold it very closely. Yeah. Okay, so as we move forward with new technologies in this space, right, it takes a long time to build one of these plants or do a risk assessment. So my question has to do with risk around solid state batteries and what kind of risk improvement or detriment you are seeing around this new technology. Because I, my understanding is the separator now is very brittle, right? So any kind of crash, are you destroying your entire separator? or what is happening, right? What, what's the risk profile? What's the risk profile with solid state? And uh, what are we seeing there in risk analysis space? Well, that's a tough question. Um, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to give you an indirect answer, I guess, you know, like a politician, you know, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I still talk. Um, no, I think I would just, uh, I would just um, you know, recommend to to really implement these risk evaluation techniques very early in the design process and in the experimental stage when you are like, you know, piloting and prototyping these new solid state batteries, you know. Personally, I, I'm not able to tell you what kind of improvements or hazards I have seen with solid state. I, I tend to still spend most of my time with lithium ion. Um, organic flow batteries, they're coming up, um, but uh, uh, um, solid state is still somewhat rare in, in my world, unless, Mark, you have worked with solid state now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how, how far in the future are we looking into these risks? Um, I'm just repeating what you said for everybody to hear, you know, 10 years or 30 years. Personally, I think it's probably less than that, you know, as, at, at least in the manufacturing environment, in the hands-on environment when we are building plants, right? Because I think we are still very, we're still very much rushed right now. There is still like, you know, it has to do with uh, government subsidies and so on. Everybody wants to hurry up, build the plants, and I think we do a lot after the fact, you know. Um, uh, but I, I do believe that the, the OEMs, like the big battery manufacturers, that they are looking into these questions, you know, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
But one last, one last comment on that, and that's where that circling back to that risk analysis and that risk portion, that's where that would come in if we're, we're anticipating at risk A, and then in two years we're past risk A and now we're in B. We can just redo that analysis to ensure that the fire protection and the life safety strategy that we implemented for risk A still would be valid for risk B. So it's not something you just have to like totally you know, rip everything out and start from scratch. There is a process in place that it can do it. You just have to come up with that same process again to do it for risk B. Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Thank you very much. <laughs>